The Miami Seaquarium, one of the most spectacular animal shows in the world. But among the obedient whales and the acrobatic dolphins, there's another unofficial show. Less spectacular, but in some ways even more impressive. You can buy food pellets here for a dime a handful. They're meant to attract the big fish, but little guppies come for them too. And at the bottom of the wall, almost ignored by the visitors, is the inventor and star of that second show, on the fringe, as you might say, a wild green heron. He commandeers some of those pellets and uses them for a very special trick. He fishes with bait, and he devised the technique entirely by himself. At first, when he went pellet fishing, he stood upright, as all fishing herons do. But the fish learnt not to come near him, and he responded by kneeling down. Presumably, he began by simply lurking in ambush beside any pellets that happened to float by. But after a while, he must have put two and two together and begun to place his pellets deliberately so that the fish were enticed towards him. That was, as it were, his act of creative genius. Hey, you two, Nan's waiting. However, you don't need to go to Miami to find out how clever birds can be. You can do that in your own back garden. You can easily arrange a setup like this yourself. Different kinds of birds react to it in different ways. These tits uh, peck and pull at things when they search for grubs and insects, so they naturally have the right sort of skills to solve this particular problem. On the other hand, blackbirds and thrushes are hopeless at it. They just peck at the glass. You can test the various talents of different kinds of birds by complicating the equipment. Though you don't need anything expensive or difficult to make, this is simply an old toothbrush holder. The reward in this experiment, as in most of the tests, is a peanut. With the possible exception of that Miami heron, most birds probably don't work out the problems like this. They make exploratory moves towards peanuts, and if one rewards them in some way, they repeat it. And so, eventually, quite complicated sequences are built up. A young nuthatch is a bit baffled. This adult, however, has already learned. This experiment was devised by John Paling, a scientist and filmmaker from Oxford, and he didn't let matters stop there. What I set out to do was to see just how much my birds could learn by offering them increasingly difficult puzzles. Here in the village of Bladen in Oxfordshire, the morning delivery of milk bottles is not only welcomed by the human residents. My local birds have been waiting to seize the opportunity of a morning pinter. Their feet were really designed for holding onto branches, and the aluminium tops must seem more like a skating rink. And look how they peck. Before impact, the beak is opened wide and only the stronger top half punctures the metal. Only then does the bird seize the cap between the beak and tear pieces off.
The upper bill is like a dagger. There's even a built-in shock absorber between it and the bird's skull. By using pressure gauges, you can show that great tits have twice as much strength in their beaks as blue tits. It crossed my mind that you could use this particular behaviour of tits to carry out more tests of bird intelligence, literally on your own doorstep. Could the birds, for example, distinguish real milk bottles from dummies lined only with paint? If they couldn't, then I had a plan that might protect my milk. We mixed a blend of paint of just the right colour to invariably fool at least humans, and then bottled it. What, we wondered, would a bird brain make of these dummies? Initially, we put down bottles that were imperfectly painted so that the camera could recognise the empties. The birds were fooled, but blue tits and great tits reacted quite differently. Blue tits apparently refused to believe it. They would move to another part of the same lid and try again up to eight times, as if hoping there might be milk there. Great tits, on the other hand, made a quick, disbelieving check. Immediately they seemed to get the picture and give up. Now here was my plan. Quite simply to put out enough dummies to make the rewards so few that it wouldn't be worth the effort. They'd get so many failures, they'd learn not to do it. So that the milkman knew what to leave, we arranged a code. For every pint of real milk, we'd put out three dummies. The birds tried them randomly, but very soon found the real one. Clearly, a rate of three failures to one success is no deterrent to a bird seeking food in the wild. In the end, we found that even ten dummies to one real one was no deterrent. So round one went to the birds, and we had to think of something new. What we needed was something that would always keep the birds off. There's something about a cat which always puts birds to fright. If I could in some way analyse what made up essence of cat, it might be possible to build an effective bird scarer. We needed a sort of milk bottle protector, incorporating and exaggerating certain cat-like features. We decided to see how the birds reacted to various shapes and textures. Whatever the birds thought about it, the kitten certainly recognised a family likeness. Using a rail system, we could wheel test objects slowly towards the preoccupied blue on the doorstep. By comparing the distance from the bottle to the cat when the bird flew off, it was possible to get some measure of the amount of fright the object on the trolley caused. Each test was repeated many times to average the results. For the results to mean anything, we had to do the control experiment. We had to be sure that the trolley itself was not frightening. It could be wheeled right up under the bird's nose. It clearly wasn't frightening. The results, well, a life-size pin-up was noticeably less frightening than the stuffed original.
Then we tried to isolate the cat-like features that mattered. A combination of a fur-covered box with eyes was effective. Without the eyes, it was only half as frightening. Finally, the birds became indifferent to my tests, so I tried some total extremes. Without the BBC's music, of course. Round two to the birds. The birds were more intelligent than I'd given them credit for. They'd learnt not to be afraid of any of my models. So, like all my neighbours, I resorted to leaving out pots for the milkman to cover our bottles with. All in all, this experiment had not been a great success. But there was still one little twist in its tail. Having encouraged them to steal my milk for over a year while we tested the various cat scarers, the tits seemed to miss something to peck at. For about two weeks after denying them their daily pinter, they took it out on my newspapers and stole the headlines. Why they should attack my newspaper, I can't explain for certain. It may be that the birds got so used to pecking in that area that when denied access to the bottles, they explored the nearest possible substitute. Probably an extension of their normal hunting behaviour of pecking behind bark for insects. However, I suspect it was some curious kind of redirected aggression brought on by frustration. Round three to the birds. I felt rather defeated, so I decided to try to test just how complicated a puzzle my birds could work out. John wanted to devise some simple equipment to which he could add complications so that he could slowly build it up to a several stage test. For a start, he just stuck a matchbox to a board and cut a window near the bottom of the outer case. He put in a few peanuts and a simple cardboard wedge, and so was able to teach the garden birds to work for their living. They just have to push down the inside tray by pecking. That's stage one. Now he was trying to discover if the birds understood the relationships between the various parts of the equipment. At first I left a small gap at the top to make it easier for them. First to arrive were great tits and blue tits, and some of them quickly got the hang of it. When most of the local tits had grasped this trick, we made the test more complicated by sticking a match through the outer sleeve and the inner tray, so that it served as a sort of lock. Now the bird has first to pull out the match, then peck down the tray. This is stage two. First, invariably, the birds tried to peck down from the top, but they soon seemed to realise that it wasn't getting them anywhere.
Now in comes a more dominant bird, but not, it seems, a wiser one. Both perform a threat display, which involves turning their backs on each other. And the more dominant bird loses. After about two months, we upgraded the gear to incorporate three stages. Now they must pull out the top match, tap down the tray as before, and then retrieve the nuts from the bottom matchbox. The plastic shield is merely to stop them getting the nuts immediately they fall. The gear looks much more complicated, but the first two stages are exactly the same as before, so the experienced bird should have little difficulty in passing that part of the test. From now on, all is new, but to help them, I've left the bottom tray slightly open. Next, by a devious trick in the workshop, we arranged that any nuts falling into the bottom matchbox couldn't be retrieved in the usual way. Now there's a hole in the lower matchbox and through the wood stand. When the box is pulled out, the nuts drop through into a perspex tube. At the beginning of each new stage, the birds need considerable perseverance. The great tits hammered away. But down at the base, an opportunist blue tit moved closer. There are now four stages to the problem, and they must be solved in the right order. Out comes the match. Down goes the tray, and here we have the clever bird hoping to get his peanuts. The sliding trapdoor delivers the nuts down the tube. The blue tit below is faced with an unexpected feast. It's all to the great tit's apparent astonishment. He's confused and frustrated, and he indulges in a bout of misdirected and useless pecking. The great tit did the work, but the blue tit cashes in. Somewhat late, the great tit twigs what's happening. But it's not quite sure where the nuts have gone. For a long while, only one blue tit could do this part of the puzzle. But that blue tit never ever solved stage three, and so relied on other blue tits or great tits to service him. These differences between individuals were very apparent. But this shouldn't be surprising. After all, there are enormous differences in intelligence between individual people, so why should there not be differences between individual birds? This one finally does all four stages my candidate for Bird Brain of Britain. John Paining's birds were volunteers.
But some people have tried to put the cleverness of captive birds to the service of man. Among them, the now retired American academic, Professor B.F. Skinner. John Poehling asked him if he thought birds to be intelligent. Uh, in the ordinary environment, uh, a bird does all it needs to do to survive, to breed, and so on. And we call it, therefore, intelligent. It adapts to its own way of life perfectly well. Uh, if you want it to adapt to your way of life, then it all depends upon how well you are able to establish that way of life. To what degree, then, do you think that the use of birds and other animals in technology might help us in the future? Is this still on the cards, do you think? Well, there are certain functions of, of a human being that can be turned over to uh, such an organism as a pigeon. There are certain, certain tasks that are very dull for people. And they get two blows. The task here is to pick out faulty plastic bolts for the car industry. Sometimes the plastic doesn't quite run into the end of the mold and the short bolts have to be picked out. What's more, in some ways, birds are better. Firstly, their concentration is better. Their minds don't wander. And second, their performance is remarkably consistent. You train them one small step at a time and reward the right actions with food. This dove has two windows in front of it. When an imperfect bolt appears, it must pick both windows. Left first, then right. It gets its reward of grain only after it has correctly rejected a bolt. For the good bolts, it pecks the left window only and the conveyor belt moves on, but it doesn't get fed. This is an experiment in a laboratory, but two American firms set up real industrial tests that were pigeon-powered. In one case, to sort out misshapen small electronic components, and in the other, pills. And some Russians tried pigeons on defective ball bearings. It showed that what Professor Skinner was suggesting was possible. Pigeons could do the job these ladies now do. What finally happened to the Russian pigeons, we don't know. But the American projects failed totally. Not because the pigeons couldn't do it, but because first the unions objected, and second, the firm's own public relations people said that there was no way to sell pigeon-sorted pills. Let's <laughs> go.